His interests are ELT and literature, Indian, European, and the US. He specializes in teaching vocabulary and has been currently researching lexicography. Therefore, now I request Professor Vedasharan to take over the session. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Welcome a colleague from Delhi University. Uh, she has been a Cambridge Naval Scholar for her PhD. Uh, Professor Crystal uh, Devadas is now with the Delhi University in the Department of English. Uh, she has been the author of Out of Line, Cartoons, Caricature, and Contemporary India, published by Odin Blackstone, New Delhi, in 2014. Her thesis itself was published as Reading Media, Writing England, The Fiction of Reddit Kipling and E. M. Foster. This was published by Macmillan in 2005. Uh, Professor Devanas has also edited a book on uh, Jane Eyre uh, for Macmillan and a passage, uh, and a passage to India for the South Asian students, published by Orient Company in 2004. She also has a critical anthology on uh, a passage to India, along with uh, Professor G.K. Das, published by Pentrap in Internet in 2005. Uh, and also, Word, Image Text, Nature and Time in Literature and the Visual Art has been uh, co-published with Sharmishta Panja and Shirshiri Chattrivar. Uh, Victoria satire and private space in public people is going to be our topic. I invite the uh, last one. Thanks. Um, good afternoon. I'd uh, like to use the space that's been given to me uh, to speculate on one uh, area of difficulty or complexity that the theme of our seminar encompasses, uh, because the uh, critical, uh, the operative phrases in the title of the seminar, the idea of a moral interface, uh, public systems, and private people. Uh, I want to look at a certain kind of a porosity and that is what I meant by saying a certain kind of a difficulty, because it seems to me that one of the areas of excitement in the field of cultural studies is very much an attempt to understand the ways in which public and private repeatedly transgress upon each other's spaces, redefine each other's spaces, and in the process, it, at, or at any rate in the process, it seems to me that what we have is not merely a redefinition of what constitutes the public, or indeed a redefinition of what constitutes private space, but uh, what we have is a very, uh, uh, a very uh, complicated, fine-tuned, uh, reassessment of the moral compass. Now the particular discipline out of which I'm going to be functioning is the discipline of caricature and cartooning, often referred to as the contrarian art of pictorial satire. And I'd like to begin by making a point about this, uh, this uh, curiously contrarian art, which is that it operates out of a space that is deceptively public at times and at others deceptively private. I say this because under normal circumstances, when we think of pictorial satire, we think of it as being the kind of art form, the kind of popular, very often the kind of populist art form that um, adds to or that feeds off what we often think of as the celebrity quotient. And uh, this is very much a concept that is at the heart of the early post-independent um, uh, pictorial satire that we have in our country. Because if you look, for instance, at these, uh, what I will call these markers of invitation within the field, you will see that they depend 
on a certain kind of an articulation, an, uh, an articulation of the relationship between what constitutes the public and indeed what constitutes the private sphere. If you begin, for instance, by uh, taking a look, and I invite you to do that, at the Abu Abraham cartoon, the very private view, I should hasten to add that uh, Abu Abraham's pocket cartoons were habitually titled private view. Now, there is a lot of irony. There is a lot of very deliberate, um, um, a, a lot of deliberate repositioning, I think, in this term, because uh, Abu's uh, pocket panels never shifted off the front page of the Indian Express. And indeed, this panel, for instance, was the one that greeted the announcement of the emergency. Now, um, Abu's point here is that his two characters, these are, by the way, people he habitually called in his time, my two congressmen. And uh, before I uh, before I uh, give it a party political spin, I should hasten to add that as Abu pointed out, the so-called grand old party in 1975 was still in the popular imagination. The party, I'm, I'm not making this comment myself, this was the way in which most people in the first half of the 70s thought that this was a party that was pretty much synonymous with the government of India. And that is why when Abu gives us the two people he calls my two congressmen, we have the short tubby character, we have the lean scraggy character, and you will notice over here that they are both literally sealing their lips. They do not want, in other words, a single thought to or a single utterance to escape them. This was one of the last cartoons, by the way, that would escape the censor. Uh, habitually after that, Abraham private view always ran some kind of battle with censorship through the emergency. But just now I don't want to talk about the emergency. What I want to do is to point out that habitually cartoonists do in fact use characters to mediate the gap between the people they represent and their viewers. So uh, this is very much a conventional invitation on the part of the cartoonist asking the people who are looking at his cartoons as it were to enter a certain kind of a private space. Now uh, we've often, uh, we are often told, and this is something that the other panel brings out, we are often told that the most beloved icon of uh, pictorial satire in India is R.K. Lakshman's common man. Now over here, the common man is doing something that is distinctly uncommon. You'll notice the Dick Whittington-like pose and the way in which he has tied all his belongings up into a spotted handkerchief. That is a snatch of the common man lifted from a very curious foray of R.K. Lakshman's into the world of the ownership of Air Deccan. This was the way in which Air Deccan, a relatively short-lived airline at that time, uh, took off literally. It had Lakshman's icon of the common man to advertise the fact that it was open to the public. It was, in other words, as close to becoming something for the ordinary masses as anything like an airline could possibly be. At the same time, I should also add that both Abu and Lakshman, in this positioning of public vis-a-vis uh, -vis private, function very much out of what I will call loosely something of a textbook con conceptualization of caricature, a textbook conceptualization of what constitutes the distinction between the public and the private. Now, um, a later cartoonist, and this is uh, Ovi Vijayan um, will use what he calls uh, my father and child. Now, why I say this is an important paradigm shift is this. Under normal circumstances, in the world of pictorial satire, the world of children is a world that is more or less sealed off from public scrutiny. Uh, the first person to, as it were, bring the child sustainedly, the figure of the child, into the domain of 
political caricature is Vijayan. And he does this very, very specifically because as he points out, he wants his readers to understand that whether the celebrity figures that he portrays elsewhere, and Vijayan time and time again takes a range of, um, of political figures, um, uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, uh, Jagjeevan Ram, Charan Singh, Chandrasekhar, to the cleaners. Uh, he, he does this, but he is always very, very conscious of the fact that for him, the person whom he will use to open up the huge gulf between the people he represents and the people for whom he represents them. He is very conscious that the figure, the focalizer that he will use is the focalizer of father and son, particularly the little child. Because as he says to him, his world of celebrities, political leaders, their sycophants, the rest of it, his world of celebrities is not to him a real world. To him, the real world, he says, is the world that is signaled by his father and child, particularly the figure of the child, because as he says, whatever else happens or doesn't happen, my child is real. My child, he says, survives on boiled roots and grass and can be found anywhere in uh, you throughout UP, throughout Bihar, because he is a living comment on the fact that the public systems that have brought about this very selective tryst with destiny are in fact utterly hollow. And time and time again, Vijayan makes this point that when we think about the child as a marker, we are not thinking only in terms of that cliche of innocence versus experience, youth and age, any of those cheerful Western European binaries with which all of us have grown up. Uh, his point is that the figure of the child is a living indictment of the fact that the public systems that claim to set up a tryst with destiny on the 15th of August 1947 have in fact failed and that the only tryst with destiny according to Vijayan that should be kept is a tryst with the undereducated malnourished people like his father and child who live way below the poverty line. And you will notice that in this figure, for instance, the father and child are waving the national flag. In the complete cartoon from which this is taken, they are waving the national flag apparently in front of Sansad Bhavan and uh, the Lok Sabha is resonating then and now with a din that will not die down. And uh, the child then turns to the father and says that we are the scandal that they should be discussing. And this sense that the child is the marker of this tragic gulf between the public people who are being represented and the apparently private individuals in front of whom these representations are playing out. This is a gulf that Vijayan intends to highlight through his use of the figures of invitation, the figures that he uses to map public space. And if we begin to think from this that the marker of the child as an invitation into a world of collision between public and private, if we begin to think that this is complicated, um, we uh, are then going to have to look at a very much more um, complex kind of en visual engagement, the visual engagement that Shreyas Navare sets. Because the point that Navare makes time and time again is that his figure of invitation, his marker that he will use to invite the people of the nameless, faceless public to look at celebrity status. His point is that he will gauge or he will, um, what's the word, he will 
negotiate this kind of a situation through his use of zero the blue donkey now I, I say the blue donkey with a little hesitation because when Navare does his blog Dabs and Jabs for the Hindustan Times, it's in color, uh, as is his Saturday cartoon for the Hindustan Times. But uh, when he uh, col when he anthologizes and collects his cartoons, they are printed in black and white. When, however, we meet zero in color, he's always blue. And the point that Navare is making, and here again, this is a restatement that Navare constructs here. The uh, traditional idea is, uh, particularly in comic satire, silence, silence, the donkey wants to bray. And indeed, the donkey does want to bray, but, and this is the point that Navare will make repeatedly in his use of pictorial satire, the point of the donkey as a marker or as a marker of invitation is yet again to compel us as viewers to reassess the relationship between the apparently public people who are on display and the apparently nameless, faceless individuals like ourselves who get to see them. At the same time, I should also point out, and this is where the sense of the contrarian art comes up, pictorial satire is unsparing in the way in which it trashes the physiognomy of a public individual for the purpose of making a certain kind of statement. And the reason I make this point is because all too often we think about um, physiognomical change, exaggeration, whatever, as being part of the conventional tools, as it were, in the work box of any cartoonist. But think about it in another way. How excoriating is this kind of physiognomical distortion? The last time any of us looked at a passport photograph of ourselves that was taken, when did we last like it? Not for a very, very long time, I dare say. My point is this. When over here we have what is, as I said, conventionally thought of as the political bestiary of the cartoonist. When we look at people as though they were, in a manner of speaking, inhabitants of the zoo held up for our inspection, think about the cost of the reduction of one's face in this manner. Nainan does this very, very often. The first um, representation that he had like this was one that he did of Chidambaram. Chidambaram was then finance minister. He had been heckled by a journalist in Delhi who threw a shoe at him. Now, what Nainan did in that case was he did a four-step um, a uh, 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 four-step panel where he showed how Chidambaram's features distort systematically until they become not like the shoe that was thrown, but the shoe that was thrown itself. And this is a relatively recent piece that he does on um, Arvind Kejriwal. Notice the way in which not just the political becomes the best year, we might say that's not always a very huge gulf, but the fact is the most sensitive, the most, um, the most personal space of an individual, the person's face, is in fact being contorted, being rubberized, being elasticated until it becomes synonymous with what the cartoonist believes is that person's private space, the, the truly vulpine, predatory world that that last sub-panel indicates. And this is Navare, uh, not nine in this time, this is Navare pulling off a similar kind of an exercise. Now, uh, this is, I, I should add that this, uh, this was a cartoon that came at a time when Uttar Pradesh had been in the news systematically for a range of violent crimes. Crimes against women, uh, 
crimes against the self and crimes also against society, you will notice that Mulayam Singh and his son, Akhilesh Singh Yadav, they are both represented. There's not here, there is, by the way, no great change between youth and age. Uh, it's simply that the younger uh, Yadav is shown as being a smaller, a more miniature um, entity than his father. Now, notice the way in which as Navare moves through the panel, he literally reduces two things. One, the status of the political leaders that he is dealing with to a single physiognomical feature, their somewhat misshapen noses, and more importantly, the status of a major, uh, a major state in India, he reduces it from the level of a functioning democracy to the level of, as he says, the banana republic. And notice the, uh, what the uh, donkey is bringing out. I mentioned Zero, the blue donkey, in an earlier panel, near Uttar Pradesh. There is absolutely no answer, no answer that can be made to any of these questions. What riots, what power cuts, what rapes, and in the end, what banana republic. So the point that I want to make here is that this dichotomy between public and private is not merely porous. It is capable of being dismantled within the space of the contrarian art. It is capable of being reversed. And we need to think a little, uh, even as we enjoy the comic reversal, we need to think a little of the consequences of this kind of reversal for the people involved and very much more seriously for the systems involved. Now. Um, that's one set of anxieties. Another set of anxieties that I want to bring uh, to our notice is the fact that within pictorial satire as a discipline of thought, there is a certain amount, yes, of the transgressive element that is that, that, that goes with the territory. But we need to think a little about the moments that pictorial satire chooses to make its statements. Now, under normal circumstances, in most cultures, the moment of death is treated as a private moment, even within the context of a study of public leaders. There is usually, or at least there was pretty much until this representation by Lakshman, a certain sense in which the dignity of the celebrity was not to be invaded, at least at the moment of death. So a large number of less than satisfactory rulers, or uh, monarchs of Britain, went to their graves with the most uh, the most uh, vengeful satirists not doing too much to them at the last gasp. Now, look at Lakshman's representation of the 31st of October 1984. You will notice that all we see of Mrs. Gandhi are her bare feet and her chappas have gone for a toss and the lower portion of her sari. We also see her blood seeping out through underneath the door. And notice the point that Lakshman is making. He has used this, this uh, representation of the broken wall before. He has used it to show how Mrs. Gandhi has, for instance, in the debate over the privy purses, completely shattered the existing political establishment. Now we see how a particular lapse in security shatters a certain kind of leadership. And the reason I bring this to your notice is to point out that there is for pictorial satire little or nothing that is by definition sacred. Even the moment of death, there is no privacy. And this sense that there is no privacy is one thing when we think of this kind of analysis. This is Navare doing a very much more recent piece on uh, Abdul Kalam at uh, when he died. Uh, this uh, Navare has lots of panels devoted to Kalam. I've chosen just this one. And again, notice the fact how this is not, by the way, condemnation, as can be seen. This uh, just stops short of hagiography. But notice the fact that as with the representation of Indira Gandhi, that comes from one extreme of castigation. This comes from the other extreme of celebration. But 
at the same time notice the way in which the features of the individual are very deliberately being erased there is a certain concentration on a what is in a sense a natural kind of a halo you'll notice the representation also of the space program but essentially the point that i want to make here is that when pictorial satire recreates the moment of death whether it does so from an extreme of celebration or from an extreme of castigation it knows no boundary between the world of public celebrity status on the one hand and private emotion on the other now the the last bundle of anxieties that i want to place before you is the fact so far we've been looking at pictorial satire as a response to public individuals now very often it is said of pictorial satire that it is by definition something of an elitist discipline because for reasons of recognizability comedy correction whatever as a rule pictorial satire does not represent private individuals i should go on to say that as with most paradigms this is a paradigm that within even my own lifetime has seen quite a few changes now this is lakshman on the 1981 crisis of sati the roopkamar sati in deorala in rajasthan and the interesting thing is i will recall this very briefly because happily many people in this room did not have to be alive when it happened uh, this uh, what happened in at this moment was roop kamar committed was a woman who was a widow who committed sati in a backward district of rajasthan by backward i simply mean a district that until then had not been picked up by the media now when she committed sati there was considerable concern that the government of the time it was a government led by rajiv gandhi hence his representation in the cartoon now there was considerable concern that at that time the government was going to go soft on those who had brought about the sati those who had compelled roop kamar to mount the funeral pyre of her husband largely because the government was at that time it was felt concerned to bring about a certain downplaying a certain um a certain regression in various forms of legislation including very specifically the shabano case so when the common man talks to rajiv gandhi over here you can see that lakshman's focus is not on the private individual roopkamar who has died in this horrific way but instead on the multiple forms of oppression torture that he embodies as sati the dowry system untouchability child marriage the caste system and so on in other words the point i want to make is that pictorial satire is perfectly capable of using the deaths of private individuals to make public points to make a strident call for change in the public sphere no matter what the cost to the individual might be jumping forward many years this is ajit nainan on the jessica lal case i should add that nainan was someone who was very much a crusader in the matter of jessica lal within the context of pictorial satire you will remember there was a point when the case looked as though it was going to collapse for want of eyewitness testimony because some witnesses had turned hostile and you'll notice uh, those two by the way are um, uh, nainan's usual office goers they are his markers of invitation into the satire you will notice that he says he has them say that the three hostile witnesses have been renamed Uh, from the three wise monkeys of course they saw nothing they heard nothing and they said nothing about manu sharma's response to jessica lal now 
you will notice here that this is a very different kind of representation because as uh, Nainan does very often, he photoshops, he picks up, he, he very deliberately sets up montages. Look at the face, for instance, of Jessica Lal, the candles, the roses, they belong to a very different kind of pictorial reality to say the caricature of the three monkeys. But again, you will notice the way in which repeatedly the pictorial satirist makes the point that if nothing is sacred, it is because there is a certain social responsibility on the shoulders of the caricaturist. This is Navare on the subject, and Navare did a lot of crusading in the matter of the December 16th Delhi gang rape case. You will notice the way in which he talks about the and this he does repeatedly in multiple other cartoons as well, the way in which uh, the so-called urbanized society of middle class Delhi is nothing other than primitive and primordial. You will notice the very partial representation of the victim here. This was a piece of work that was done while the victim was still alive in contrast to this one. And I want you to think, uh, to, to look a little at the way in which by representing a private individual in this way, notice the plethora of people who Navare shows us at Heaven's Gate waiting to meet her, Gandhi, Nehru, there's Mother Teresa, diverse Bhagat Singh. You'll notice the way in which, again, there is this enormous porosity between the public and the private. There is a sense in which there is for pictorial satire, for the uh, contrarian art, no absolute boundary. And again, and this is a very different kind of uh, illustrator, uh, which Vishwajyoti Ghosh. This is Ghosh not wearing so much his hat as a cartoonist as his hat as a worker in graphic fiction. This is what he did in the wake of the Peshawar uh, bomb blast in Pakistan. He collaborated with a Pakistani writer to come up with a 12 panel illustration of uh, the consequences for civil society, particularly civil so that segment of civil society that consists of young people. Because Ghosh's point here was, it is not enough to talk about violence done to children. We need to think about educating children so that they become conscious of how they, in turn, respond to violence that is directed at them. And please notice the gun sites that uh, uh, Ghosh maps onto the uh, little uh, girl's school satchel. Uh, notice the fact that over here, Ghosh is ready to use resources of narrative. Navare was ready to use resources of national myth, but uh, Ghosh goes one step further. He uses resources of a partly fictional, partly realistic narrative to give us a sense of the way in which uh, the public and the private components of civil society need to rethink their territories because it is important not just for civil society to change, but more seriously for the most vulnerable component of so-called civil society, namely children, to be sensitized, to be conscientized, to understand how to deal with violence directed very specifically at them. And with this cartoon, I come to the end of this portion of the presentation, which is, you will notice that here, when um, Navare wants to respond to the death of the little Syrian refugee, Aylan Kurti. He follows a certain road. We can talk about the road that he chooses, or indeed the road that other people choose, in contrast. Um, notice the fact that the little boy is not shown. Instead, what we have is a teddy bear washed up upon the beach. And we can discuss, if you wish, whether or not this is the world's most radical response. But it is worth thinking about the fact. And this is something that Navare does, even with the Peshawar bombing, when he has a, a similar panel. Uh, he points out that there are moments when even the conventional representation of death breaks down when confronted with the horrors 
of contemporary life. And in fact, more than once, Navare, like Ghosh, makes the point that contemporary forms of violence are enough to shame death into almost uh, withholding itself or withdrawing itself from the scene. And this brings me to my very last point, uh, which is what is the moral compass of this art? Uh, it is very difficult, or at least I find it very difficult, to think through this question. Because time and time again, we have to ask ourselves, not just are public and private, private worlds reassessed in terms of each other, but very specifically, should we not be reconfiguring these spaces so that they function in a, in a way that is very much more welcoming, very much more secure for those who are the most vulnerable members of civil society. And that is why this question of the moral compass of pictorial satire repeatedly raises itself. If in fact there is nothing sacred, in that case, where do we go in terms of the representation of the public or indeed in terms of the representation of private worlds? The jury is still out. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Professor Vlasi, for a very, very interesting lecture. I'm sure you have emotionally and intellectually brought in and deepened our perception of that process. And uh, I now welcome questions from our audience. Did not realize its consequences until visualized in the 
we have any other questions? Hello, uh, ma'am. Ma'am, pictorial satires, as far as uh, the Western world is concerned, we saw after the Charlie Hebdo incident, we saw after uh, Alan Kurti incident, but as far as India is concerned, in recent times, whatever uh, pictorial satire has come up in the social media, they have been faced with a lot of political uh, repercussions. You know, people have been literally put behind bars, which I did not see uh, in uh, the Western examples. So what would you say is the future of uh, pictorial satire in India? Um, see, this is a slightly uh, difficult uh, area because you are right when you say that in contemporary Western Europe people are not put behind bars but uh, for the pictorial satire that they undertake, whereas to our, uh, to our continued uh, disgrace, uh, a scene privately was in fact jailed. Uh, it is also true that the uh, Charlie Hebdo uh, attack that happened uh, was, uh, I think, very much a product of its politics of location. Western Europe tends to align itself along lines of ethnicity, religious hatred, in a way that hitherto pictorial satire in India has resolutely refused to do. I think one of the things that happened with uh, with several uh, visuals, uh, with several controversies around visual satire in the last few years, the representation of the, uh, the rep representation of uh, the Bhagavad uh, Gita uh, crisis in the 50s in Ramana, uh, then uh, as uh, you pointed out uh, with Azim Trivedi and even in uh, with reference to Mamta Banerjee. Uh, I think one of the problems here is quite simply, and I don't think any one person may feel responsible for this. We do not see enough visual satire in India. We tend to see relatively little, and the problem with social media in this case is that the when a representation goes viral on social media, it very often goes viral lifted out of its original print context, so out of its original political, cultural context. That is a problem and that, I think, makes for this major response. The equivalent of the early 80s ban the satanic verses, never mind, no one has read. I think we are there with our reading of visual satanic. Thank you. Maybe I'll take one uh, chance to ask you just a little bit deep question. What precisely do you mean by that? Um, you see, one of the charges that has repeatedly been brought against Victoria Satire is that it glamorizes the very politicians it seems to be castigating. And a good example of this was a very early 1950s representation of, at that time, a horrendously unpopular British uh, Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan. The cartoonist represented him in great anger and anger aggravation as Super Mac and drew a poster cartoon of uh, Mac Miller in Superman's costume to show that Mac Miller thought himself to be a uh, supremely uh, wonderful but in fact was capable of doing nothing. Now this cartoon had a very unfortunate effect. Many people on seeing this decided that Mac Miller who had done an appalling first term was Superman, went out, voted for him and returned him by a good margin for his second term. So that is why when I use the term celebrity quotient, I refer here not so much to the status of these individuals as to the somewhat overinflated, exaggerated status that pictorial satire risks the journey on them. I think it's a very real risk. Just have one question. Uh, by definition, pictorial satire, uh, the purpose of it is to disturb. That there is something, there, there is something, like you said, very wrong in this picture itself. Uh, as much as I agree with it, there is something which disturbs me is uh, what pictorial satire, which I feel sometimes it does, it also reduces that very violence to mere binaries of, say, just rape or just uh, death. Over here, for example, uh, this very image, it's as if uh, when death is saying, it's just as if death 
and a teddy bear, which means a boy, a small baby being killed. But whereas the need of the art is also to problematize violence, not just uh, through ethnic lenses, through other lenses as well. So even the uh, image that you showed of rape, that man has become mortal, but what is happening? So what I'm trying to say, that there's a politics of time also in this, where it is assumed, a certain modern is assumed. And it's only these blatant, uh, I will say zero signifiers of death, rape, the shattering, uh, is called upon to shatter this, utopian image of the human. But whereas this, the, the, the point why these images become very disturbing is also uh, the, the ethnicity, the culture, the caste, these uh, very factors. But this picture, for example, just reduces it to just it. That is an occupation um, as a, that sort of goes with the territory. Because one of the concerns that is repeatedly, one of the charges that is repeatedly is precisely this reductionism of which you are speaking. Now, in the early 70s, I think it was 1974, when Abu Abraham was dealing with a particular election in Uttar Pradesh, uh, he drew, drew this cartoon, vote your caste. Now, at that time, it, the, the cartoon had a certain potential to disturb. Now, now but this was, by the way, one of the cartoons that many, many years after 1974, went viral as it were with retrospective effect on the name. It became an international shorthand for pointing out that in India, the only politics that it takes is the politics of caste, and therefore India is nothing other than a failed democracy. Now, is that some, is that a risk that Karthuni runs with reductionism? Yes, it is a huge risk. It is particularly a huge risk when Karthuni is sort of separated from other forms, from other kinds of media activism and media invitation. So there is nothing I think that can be done to make things better in that sense. It is a risk that has to be recognized that can be uh, negotiated, if that's the right word, by using multiple other forms of representation. But I don't think it can be done. Um, uh, Max B. is on the essay points out, it's called the humor of the public. He points out the idea that the intellectual joke always is put pitted against the background of sadness. That it, it's never the pure attack or the smashing of the of an ape or somebody's face. Never physical like that. Uh, is it okay here to, to say that point here? Uh, my second question to you would be, what would be the inspiration for these figures that these cartoons draw? I remember in, 19, in the 1950s, uh, this story about uh, Prince Philip coming to India, and he was received by two congressmen. One of them was very tall and the other was very short. And uh, Prince Philip remarks, uh, looking at them. So this is the long and short of it. So uh, I would like to pick this. Okay, with reference to the first question, that is it as ever as simple as smashing a cake or a castle pie? Uh, you know, sometimes it, 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 it is not as simple, no. But it is also true that even the laughter that ensues when a particular kind of person is seen to slip on a banana skin, on the one hand, on the one hand, that might be just that. On the other, it depends on who the person is. If we can see a head of government slipping on a banana skin in a cartoon, does that make for laughter which originates out of slapstick but become something else? Yes, I, uh, I think it does. Uh, the other question, the more complicated uh, question, as to how does this find the world arise? What is its inspiration? Uh, Lakshman and Nainan have said repeatedly that no cartoon can be funnier than the political leadership of South Asia. And they have said this uh, repeatedly. Now, the difficulty in taking this 
Sister Krishna for your presence. Dr. Nalini Parsaram, probing the consistent tension between the public and the private through her talk, Discretion, Deceit, and the Conceit of the Public Eye. Nalini, may we please have you on the desk. To chair the session, I would request Dr. Jai Singh to please come on stage. <laughs> Dr. Jai Singh is an assistant professor in the Department of Indian and World Literatures at EFLU. He is greatly interested in contemporary theory, post-colonial theory and literature, Indian writing in English, feminism, cultural studies, and Orientalism. He has several publications to his credit in both national and international journals. As part of the Indo-Hungarian Educational Exchange Program 2011, Dr. Singh has delivered a series of lectures at the Central European University, Budapest, Hungary. He has also taught at the University of Turk, Finland, under the Indo-Finnish Faculty Exchange Program. It is a pleasure to have you with us today, sir. And I now request you to introduce our plenary speaker, Dr. Lanili. Dear friends, good morning to all of you, and I welcome you to the plenary session. I am highly thankful to Dr. Prakash Kona for providing me an opportunity to chair this session. And I feel uh, privileged that I am assigned the task to introduce and welcome our distinguished keynote speaker, Dr. Nalini Persra. She is an associate professor in the Department of Social Sciences, Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies, York University, Toronto, Canada. And before joining this university, she has taught in some other institutes, Department of Political Science, University of Dublin, Trinity College, Department of Liberal Arts, University of the West Indies, and Florida International University. She has published in the areas of feminist theory, international political theory, and post-colonial theory, along with a large number of research papers in reputed journals and edited books and anthology. She has authored two books, very important books in the field of post-colonial theory, post-colonialism and post-colonial theory, and another one is sovereignty and subjectivity. Today, she will give us a talk on discretion, deceit, and conceit of the public eye. Now, I request ma'am to come here and deliver us her talk. I think. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers, uh, in particular Dr. Professor now, Prakash Kona, for inviting me to uh, speak at this conference. I find it uh, a very, very interesting conference, both diverse and coherent and I do feel privileged to be a part of it. I would like to warn you that this paper is a paper of political theory, so we'll see how it goes. I hope it's not going to be too tedious. Originally, the title, Discretion, Deceit, and Conceit of the Public Eye, arose out of um, an idea I had about how I'd wa I wanted to speak about the private sphere as regards to how we consider it to be, as we heard in previous papers, secret. Secrecy is associated with deceit, deception, but also discretion. I wanted to talk about the way that the public eye, especially in politics, has constructed people in a particular way in this particular time, um, as we heard again, of surveillance, the internet, various devices that enable the visual visualization of the private in ways that we perhaps don't find very comfortable. It then morphed into something to do with Richard Rorty's understanding of the private sphere as the sphere of aesthetics. As I delved into research on that aspect, I came across Hannah Arendt, whose work 
I am actually not that familiar with, I am ashamed to say. However, once I started reading it, I was very captured by it and decided that the paper really should be about her work. Uh, perhaps a future paper will engage in what I had wanted to do, which is a comparative analysis of the role of aesthetics in Rorty's work as well as Arendt's work. So he, in fact, despite the abstract, is taking a back seat. I might say a few words about his work at the end, but basically I'm talking about Arendt. The public-private relation is a well-worn theme in social and political thought. Its implications have been addressed by many disciplines, schools of thought, intellectuals, and engaged citizens. This is unsurprising given that liberals, conservatives, um, communalists, and others in Western style societies consider it conceptually to encompass all that there is in modern life outside of state power. The respective contents of these two spheres are not consistent across political theories. For liberals, the private is the space of freedom. For Republicans, freedom resides in the public arena. Among philosophers who are by no means the most important protagonists in this theater, there is much disagreement as to what constitutes these realms and why it matters. But in a world that increasingly valorizes the economics of the private through the privatization of services, institutions, the commons, and so on, it is the celebration of sovereign individuality, individuality via the private sphere that dominates. The result is that more and more of the few are empowered while more and more of the many are abandoned. This process is accompanied by a particular configuration of morality with which we are all familiar, especially given its neoliberal pretension and proclivity to being universalist. It is analogous to my view of power, which is that it is its own legitimacy. Wealth is its own pristine morality. The comfortable and the rich are the washed and the godly. Ergo, the great unwashed can go to the devil. This is not news. So what is? Well, for the first time in history, a generation of global proportions, including the industrial north, has very little to live for. That little being a decaying ecology and the latest gadget technology. That the latter is constantly being renewed may be viewed as a panacea to the reality of a bleak future and a way to achieve immortality through selfies on the internet. The joy of finding water on Mars speaks volumes. This planet is dying. And for us to continue in the lifestyle to which we have become accustomed, we need to move to another. Not so fast is my response. Although it is true that neuroscience is propelling us deeper into our brains, it has also recognized that cognition is embodied. That is, the body and its movements inform how the, mind and concept, how the mind conceptualizes things, which, as an aside, is an effective deconstruction of the mind-body problem. Resorting to analogy again, one could say that just as neoliberalism seduces us deeply into the private, so it has recognized that the value of profit depends on public acquiescence. The key is thus to ensure that what dominates the public domain is an ideological currency that does not see wealth as mere pleasure, but as dire need at the level of economic survival, political security, and species existence. Many of us understand this arrangement as we have been watching it intensify for decades. I need not mention numerous examples, such as the destruction of Iraq, the Edward Snowden case, the future existence of the largest national number of billionaires beside millions of poverty-soaked lives the global sex and labor slavery of women and children. The point is a simple one. Either we acknowledge that global oppression has surpassed crisis dimensions, or we don't. Either we take back the commons on all fronts, or not. 
In what follows, I present an argument for the preservation and expansion of public political space based on, first, the assertion that it is potentially one of the most effective ways of intervening in this contemporary romance with ruination. And second, that we have a choice. To these means, I consider the possibilities of one conception of the public realm that has been hugely influential in social and political thought in the 20th century. Hannah Arendt, a German Jewish philosopher who fled Europe for the US in the late 1930s, has contributed in quite original ways to the ideas of politics, truth, and freedom. Known for her staunch defense of the separation of public from private, her thought is controversial, stimulating, demanding. It does not easily lend itself to categorization. Three aspects of her work have been chosen for this talk. Truth, aesthetics, and subjectivity. Each theme takes thought in unexpected directions that I find extremely significant at this point of world historical time. Through the nuanced work of Arendt, scholars like Zerilli and Mark Batson, for the most part, that's Linda Zerilli, um, have looked at Arendt's complex work. Sorry, that didn't make sense. Uh, through the nuanced work of Arendt scholars, Linda Zerelli and Mark Button, for the most part, in this paper, I mean, Arendt's complex work, which has drawn its inspiration in fundamental ways from that of Heidegger of the 20th century and Kant of the 18th, is deciphered. And I hold it up as an example of how to think, judge, and create in critical times. I begin with a quotation from Mar Margaret Canavan, who wrote the introduction to the 1998 edition of The Human Condition, originally published by Arendt in 1958. Quote, Hannah Arendt is preeminently the theorist of beginnings, end quote. Her theory of action and retrieval of praxis, a concept of antiquity, is the most original offerings, are the most original offerings to political thought of the last decade, says Maurizio Dantreve. And it is not difficult to see why, once the tree of concepts Arendt cultivates is traced from root to leaves. Praxis is different from poesis, which is fabrication or creation. Arendt connects it to freedom and plurality and in connecting it to speech and remembrance, politics is reconceived. Questions of meaning and identity are approached in an unprecedented way. Action is understood as a mode of human community or togetherness. And through this notion, Arendt produces the idea of participatory democracy contrasted to politics as bureaucracy and elitism, the kind of which we have all become extremely weary. Two fundamental aspects of action are freedom and plurality. Neither the liberal idea of being able to choose among a set of possible or alternatives, nor the Christian doctrine of God-given free choice. Freedom here refers to the ability to, quote, begin to start something anew, to do the unexpected, with which all human beings are endowed by virtue of being born." End quote. Plurality is the notion that nothing can be named political, can occur in complete independence of others, who from their sp specific worldviews judge the caliber of what is being enacted in freedom. Having briefly set the stage for a discussion about truth, I now turn to the first of the three chosen themes. Arendt on truth. There has been agreement over the past few decades, notes Mark Button, among certain prominent scholars about the way political dialogue by citizens in pluralistic liberal democracies may proceed most feasibly and fairly. 
It resides in the notion of public reason, which is aligned with reciprocity, impartiality, the moral viewpoint, and democratic integrity. One question that arises pertains to religious and moral convictions and their role in informing opinion that enters the public sphere. To what extent is conformity to public reason indicative of good and reasonable democratic practice? For John Rawls, the influential liberal thinker, public reason is what ensures secular, non-sectarian exchange between citizens. It is a language, grammar, or discourse that individuals must adopt in order to communicate with each other outside the private domain. Thus, all truths, religious, philosophically moral, ethnic, racial, etc., necessarily become opinions in the public. Absolute truth, it would appear, is at odds with politics. Arendt, however, accepts that truth claims persist. The response, though, is not to translate them into liberal terms or to ignore them, but to talk them through constantly in public and thus humanize them. She disagrees with the dominant liberal, liberal view that the public should be cleansed of any theisms, stating that since religious and other forms of identity inform in part who one is, that is, one's distinctive personal identity, or humanitas, these elements will inevitably surface in any public articulation. Attempting to preclude them would be trying to, quote, transform men into something they are not. Arendt is not knowing, known for being a feminist, incidentally. Those who speak their individual truths take a risk. What is my truth may be rendered mere opinion. This means that courage and moderation are crucial virtues if I am to take this risk. But democratic society should be about voicing as many perspectives as possible so as to grasp the world as a community of differences. The other possibility then is that through discourse, persuasion, and argument, or sorry, agreement, I should say, a particular truth holds the potential to become a general, that is, democratically accepted one. Thirdly, it is through an engagement with critical publicity, that is, criticality from others as well as myself, as I seek to understand other worldviews, that one actually comes to know one's own thoughts and thus develops the ability to form opinions. The matter of subjectivity creeping in here will be developed further on in the paper. Quite likely, it is clear by now that what is presupposed in this framework of the public is willingness on the part of citizens to voice their honest opinions. What citizens receive in return is the encouragement to learn, to listen sincerely, to put themselves in the place of others. This is not about epistemological assumptions of epistemic violence or the obliteration of difference. As Arendt says, it is about being able to understand different world views, not necessarily different people. And this distinction becomes important later on. It is a distinction between the public and the private, humanitas and intimacy. The point is that one does not have to get personal and psychologically intimate with individuals which can be called love, something Arendt says is anti-political. Rather, one must be able to perceive and appreciate a different way of seeing. This seeing representatively, as she calls it, is about a coming to an understanding of the truth claims made by others through their opinions. It constitutes plurality, a uniquely Arendtian conceptualization defined as action in view of another and is one of the fundamental aspects of the public domain. A controversial argument Arendt makes regarding plurality is that is a means of seeking the validity of truth claim. It means that the validity of truth claims is of lesser importance than maintaining freedom in the public. And fundamentally, Arendt is a theorist of freedom, 
She's very difficult to categorize. Uh, emphasizing that she is a theorist of freedom is not to call her a liberal, although that is a liberal value. In fact, before I carry on, I should make it clear that Arendt's understanding of the difference between public and private is not a liberal understanding. For her, freedom resides in the public. For liberals, freedom resides in the private. She is a Republican of the classical tradition. So the validity of truth claims is not as important as maintaining freedom in the public. So what does this mean? Persuasive opinion, not compelling truth claims, is what constitutes the domain of the public. This notion goes a long way in accounting for Arendt's conception of freedom. For her, truth is considered to be a kind of threat to public space because of its coercive nature. As a thing belonging to the category of the universal, Truth acts as a standard against which the particular is measured and subsumed. That is, there is no particular which, as stated above, holds the potential to become a different universal. There is no particular that is allowed to exist as simply a particular. The pre-political entity called truth in the public domain compels citizens to measure all truth claims against it. In other words, it is a pre-existing kind of law with which all difference must fit or to which it must confirm, conform if it is to establish its validity. Arendt's adherence to opinion differentiated from truth by virtue of being a viewpoint that is not constrained by a pre-existing standard is the condition of freedom in the public sphere. The new far from being translated into the familiar grammar of truth in order to decide upon its validity, is not obliterated, but allowed to exist. This is an existence subject to political judgment, not the binary logic of validation. Zerilli, having thought at first that Arendt leaves truth completely out of the public sphere, subsequently identifies a fine distinction made between the role of truth and that of validity in this space. It is not really that truth has no place. It is that truth as arrived at via or via proof only has no place in the public. In other words, truth arrived at through logical proofs has no place in the public. Now this sounds a little peculiar, but that is the basis of public reason. In short, Arendt looks not to Plato, the philosopher of absolute truths, but to Socrates, the thinker of persuasion. The correspondence theory of truth, or the idea of truth being a universal under which the particular is subsumed, is, in the public domain of politics, inappropriate. Truth is about appearance and therefore how, as Homi Baba has put it in a different context, how newness enters the world. The question is about how truth is to be viewed. Ernesto Grassi maintains that there are different modes in which things appear, and necessity assumes a form pertinent to each. Truth in politics has a very specific appearance. This leads us to the next theme aesthetics. So what kind of truth can operate in the field of the public, the political? Arendt emphasizes in the sphere, in politics as a sphere of appearances, the way she emphasizes it as, she says, it appears to me. It's a phrase that Socrates used when Plato was describing the way that he would move among the citizens and talk with them, not to or at them, but with them, to learn what they thought. So it appears to me is the same as saying it is my opinion that. This has many affinities with Kant's, Immanuel Kant's philosophy of aesthetics. In the Critique of Judgment, she finds Kant's unscripted political philosophy. <laughs> 
The first part of it, the critique of aesthetic judgment, dealt with the world of appearances as the judging spectator saw it. It began with the faculty of taste, understood as a faculty of concrete and embodied subjects. Connecting taste to that wider manner of thinking that Kant referred to as an enlarged mentality, Arendt saw, saw how a reevaluation of judgment or revaluation of judgment could occur such that it could be understood as a specific political ability, namely that of being able to think in positions taken by others. As Dancleve explains, and I quote less out of laziness than being out of writing time, it is only in Kant's critique of judgment that we find a conception of judgment as the ability to deal with particulars in their particularity, that is, without subsuming them under a pre-given universal, but actively searching the universal out of the particular. Kant formulated this distinction as that between determinant and reflective judgments. For him, judgment in general is the faculty of thinking the particular as contained under the universal. If the universal, the rule, principle, or law, is given, then the judgment which subsumes the particular under it is determinant. If, however, only the particular is given and the universal has to be found for it, then the judgment is reflective. For Kant, determinant judgments were cognitive, while reflective judgments were non-cognitive. And this, to me, is just to interrupt the quote, extremely important. Reflective judgment is seen as the capacity to ascend from the particular to the universal without the mediation of determinate concepts given in advance. Again, to interrupt the quotation, this is how newness enters the world. It is reasoning about particulars in their relation to the universal rather than reasoning about universals in relation to their particular. End quote. For Arendt, reflective judgments are exercises in freedom. This is freedom from structures of direction such as religion, philosophy, or public reason. Arendt's idiosyncratic reading of Kant is, rather interest, is a rather interesting idea in that it is the judging activity of spectators, not the object they judge or its maker that creates the public space. And here we are talking about public space as a constructed entity, as something that only exists in practice. It is not a pre-existing space defined in um, political conceptual terms, but rather through praxis. And again, this to me is extremely significant. It's, it's, it's significant because We are used to maps. We are used to direction. As somebody said to me the other day, what do you need knowledge for if you have Google? I had to agree, since I have no memory. However, don't you think it's weird and peculiar that it is easier for us, as some European theorist or Latin American theorist, I forget who, said, it is easier for us to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine a new practice of politics. That is why this is important. So I've segued into subjectivity. I haven't. Arendt did. And you may have noticed that this paper is structured like a set of Russian dolls, meaning that the first theme, truth, had a lot of time spent on it. The second theme, less time. And the third theme, subjectivity, not too much. Why? Because each concept is contained in the other. So in expanding the notion of truth, we hear that truth is only understood in distinction to opinion. In opinion is only understood in terms of Arendtian interpretations of Kant's aesthetics. And when we look at the relation of aesthetics, that is judging, 
through subjectivity, what we find is that in judging other people, and you can't judge other people until they've stated their opinions, and when they state their opinions, they are forming the self. In judging other people, we are witnessing the emergence of subjectivity. This, again, is interesting. Liberals don't think like that. Liberals are individualists. Their ontology is individualism. That means that the subject is preformed before it enters the political. The subject is preformed before it enters the social. Now this is related to truth insofar as we have an already, always already formed, made thing that we call either the subject, politics, the social, that we enter into or engage with, et cetera, et cetera. This is another way of articulating sovereign subjectivity. The idea that we as subjects are sovereign, that we are impenetrable, which of course we're not, we all know that. We've known that since Freud, I would say since Marx, at least. So what Arendt is talking about is the way that we as public humans create humanitas through the emergence of subjectivity, through the emergence and formation of our own selves by virtue of an engagement with other public selves. So in my own experience, I've always said, I don't have a clue what I think until I open my mouth or write, unfortunately. This is not good for teaching, by the way. However, it does mean that there is something else at work beyond consciousness, beyond rationality. And although Arendt does not delve into psychoanalysis, she is basically talking about things that both Freud, Lacan, and again, I'm sorry, Marx talked about. She's not a Marxist though, she's very critical of Marx. So basically what we're talking about is non-sovereignty. And the nature and value of public speak, speech and action is such that actors, as she calls them, do not have autonomous control over the self. You don't arrive in the public sphere. You don't arrive at politics as a fully formed self ready to disclose the self. Rather, it discloses you. I would bet a lot of money that this is rather disturbing, given what happens in politics, in the public theater. So non-sovereignty is one aspect of subjectivity in Arendt's work. And in elaborating what she means by this, she draws on Greek religion, Roman sources, this is Mark Button speaking, to explain the idea of disclosure as being the disclosure of who someone is, not what somebody is. And it's implicit in everything a person says and does. And you can only hide this in complete silence and passivity. On the other hand, Disclosure is never full. Now this is, to use the discourse of agency, this is where agency lives, in the fact that disclosure is never full. This is where movement, in my opinion, can be made in politics. If we come to understand what Arendt is trying to do 
trying to teach us. We see that the infinite actually exists in politics. And I think that, generally speaking, the general public thinks the opposite. Politics is a very, very finite domain. It's a very oppressive, finite domain. And people like Rorty will head for the hills of the private domain and work on the aesthetics of the self all by the self. So disclosure for her is about the who, which appears to others in the public domain, but in fact remains hidden from the person himself. Like the diamond in Greek religion, who, which accompanies each man through, throughout his life, says Mark Button always looking over his shoulder from behind and thus visible only to those he encounters. Arendt links this diamond, the idea of an overseeing god or spirit, with an individual's unique humanitas, which Arendt tends to treat as a non-subjective personality or distinct humanness. This is what's interesting about what she's talking about. The language, grammar, she uses, seems to belong in the private domain. But in fact, she puts it somewhere else. And this is actually crucial for understanding what she's trying to do and what makes her a Republican. And I don't mean American Republican. Okay, that is, they don't even, like, that isn't even in the, there's no such thing, okay? This personal element in man, quoting Button again, can only appear where a public space exists. That is the deeper significance of the public realm, which extends far beyond what we ordinarily mean by political life. To the extent that this public sphere or space is also a spiritual realm, there is manifest in it what the Romans called humanitas. This, I think, is the crux. This is the peak of um, Arendt's contribution, distinct contribution to an understanding of the public. We never think of the public, I would venture as a spiritual domain. In fact, it's quite the opposite, again. But she's linking the public domain to a spirituality, to humanitas, and yet, you know, this is not a religious person. This is not somebody advocating uh, religious, moral, ethic, ethical, um, ethnic, racial, etc. values within the public sphere. And yet, she uses the term spiritual. This non-subjective, this non-controllable humanitas, humanitas is, is a risk. And it basically translates into a gift that we give to others, and of course, therefore, to ourselves as we venture into the public realm. I'm going to end there by putting up that, which has been there the whole time, has it? Okay. So I just want to use this to clarify what exactly Arendt is trying to do. I'm also trying to squeeze a paper into a pre existing title. It actually worked. So, Deceit, Discretion, Conceit, Public Eye. That was the original title. Now, I was trying to figure out how to uh, not ask me to change it, because it's already in print. So let's just look at this stuff. Here, not that. That'll come later. Hmm? That's OK. I'm not going any further. Uh, deceit. So deceit, of course, 
is synonymous with lies. Lies is the opposite of truth. There we have a binarism. These are absolutes. Discretion is something else. Discretion is not opinion. So let's just talk for a second about what it is. How much time do I have left? Five minutes? Ten minutes. Discretion, of course, is not opinion. However, the ambiguity of discretion, the way that you can play with discretion, is similar to the way that opinion is, she doesn't use the word play, but is effectively, for the liberals, toyed with, tinkered with, to actually squeeze truth out of it. So with discretion, for some people, to be discreet means to be secret. For others, it's the epitome of tact. So opinion, for her, is a way of speaking, kind of in a tactful way, insofar as we are actually speaking with others in an openness, and we are being judged by others who are equally open. The problem for liberals is that the relativism of opinion, the relativism of what discretion is and is not, produces a lack of resolution. And liberals hate that. Okay? One plus one equals two, and that better be the case forever, because that assures us of something. So what is conceit? Conceit, I'm aligning with public reason, because for Arendt, it is a conceit. It's a liberal conceit to think that public reason actually does anything, or at least does what it claims to. It's pre-political, which again is a conceit to call it politics, to put it in the, in the political domain when it's already always already made, preformed. It's pre-political. There's a conceit attached to, therefore, using public reason in the public domain. But if we align, if we look at the bottom here, conceit, what liberals uh, would view Arendt's work as being a kind of conceit is the very idea that opinion has any place in the public realm. But opinion, if we use the analogy of edibility, is something, according to Arendt, that we listen to and we judge. Judgment is about actually thinking and making a decision about whether or not something is acceptable. And if enough find it acceptable, it becomes a universal truth. It becomes nutrition. But if enough disagree with it, it is not nutrition, it's junk food. So it's either nutrition or junk for the body politic. What is the public eye? The public eye is plurality. It's the existence of people together, in togetherness, in community. That's what plurality is. All of this is predicated on the idea that the self is non-sovereign. So what I didn't put on the top there, I could have, is a sovereign self you know, to, to represent liberals and the non-sovereign self to represent Arendtian republicanism. Up here is simply a guide to understanding where she's coming from. <clears throat> there are a lot of concepts in Arendt, and I didn't want to go through them all. But basically, what I didn't mention is that she uses the term action in a particular way. She, she uses it, well, I suppose I mentioned it at the beginning, to refer to praxis, as opposed to poesis. Um, 
Praxis is, is what action and praxis, action as praxis, is what basically encompasses freedom and plurality. Together with speech and remembrance, it leads to something that allows togetherness in such a way as to foster or to allow for the emergence of humanitas, which is not uh, fleeting through just, just speech which evaporates, she says, but through collective memory. And one thing she says, which I didn't get into, is she mentioned something that I think is interesting in terms of temporality. She speaks of the way that we as humans are finite beings, but the public domain is not. So although we enter the public domain and then leave it, and it, it remains, we remain in it through our contribution to it. And that's what she talks, that's what she means when she says speech and remembrance. Where all this takes us is to a conception of politics where meaning and identity can be newly addressed, which means a new form of participatory democracy. So in conclusion, I just want to emphasize that The risk that we would have to take if we were to be Arentians is to first of all acknowledge that we as individuals, even though we can use the discourse of individualism, are not sovereign. But that we, in fact, emerge to ourselves and to others through an engagement with others. This means that if you think you can hide in the private, if you think you can develop the self in the private domain, you can't. Now, this is pretty radical. Is it not the case that in the private domain we are protected, that we have our kinship networks, our interests, our passions, our perversities, that are, you know, free to be. One has to answer yes to that question. But that does not mean that it is the private that allows us. It's the only space that allows for the emergence of the self. So once again, I'd like to repeat that it is rather perverse and astounding that we are capable of working ourselves into a paranoid frenzy over imagining what the end of the world looks like. And yet we, generally speaking, still cannot bring ourselves to imagine being the kinds of individuals Arendt is talking about in her version of the public sphere. Thank you. I thank Nalini Basram to deliver such a thought-provoking talk on this topic. Her paper becomes very important because we are living in an age where each one of us is caught in a web-like inclusiveness of power, which is employed and exercised through a net-like organization, where we as individuals circulate between the threads of power, and where the spaces of public and private converge and diverge with all these you know, threads and where we act as the consenting targets as well as the micro centers for exercising the power that comes from, sometimes comes from the public spaces and sometimes travels from the, the private spaces to the public uh, spaces. So 
Now I open this session for questions. If you have any questions, you can ask. Thank you. because of her commitment to a certain 
classical Republican understanding of what politics is. The second thing you said, which is actually the first thing you said, has to do with you know why basically you take such a negative view of the imagination. Right? Yeah. I can see why you say that, especially if you your presentation. Not great. The artists would think that it should be something that. However, one can take, you know, one can say anything, and it will be true. One can say that we are a very um, a species with great potential. That we are capable of changing our future. That we're you know, lots of positive things. We can also say lots of negative things. The question is, what political point do you want to make at a particular time? The political point I wanted to make today was in relation to Arendt's theory. So what she's trying to do is articulate a way of looking at politics that moves beyond fixity. And in, in looking at the way that liberals think they're moving beyond, think they're, think they're liberal, think they're progressive, uh, taking a negative spin on our ability or inability to imagine is to, in a way, is a rhetorical way of uh, underlining what we're going to say. So, personally, just to bring personal. I can't live in, in depression. You know, I can't, I have children, right? I have to be happy. I have to make them feel that the, the world is not going to come to an end. That, that, you know, it's okay. But what I think is that it's not okay. So there are strategies of living, and being positive is one strategy of living. But, you know, to also be critical, in a Marxian sense, which is to say that we think critically, that we identify structures of oppression, but that we also identify avenues of agency is also important. I'm not sure if I have answered your question. this completely, but uh, your position regarding the aesthetic. You were speaking about the aesthetic almost as though it sounded to me as though it was a separate you know, category. So I was also thinking about how today we speak of the aesthetic as being intensely political. So how can we really speak about the separateness of the two? Okay. Isn't the aesthetic always already political? structures of feeling, whatever. There is something there that is a grammar 
that allows us to be able to say one thing or another. Now, you know, uh, that's kind of a really old-fashioned way of looking at a step, right? Because if you look at uh, Marcel Duchamp putting your rhino in the art gallery, okay, is that beautiful? Well, that's not even the right question. The question is, is it art? Art does not have to be beautiful. So, you know, this, this, I see where your question is coming from because it, it makes perfect sense. Like, you know, the aesthetic, how does that? It's not autonomous from a politics at all. This is what I'm just doing. In fact, what I can gather from what I've you know, researched so far, she is precisely making the aesthetic political. She is saying, that if we look at the way Kant talks about judgment and that we need to be able to, as she says, think, we can't just sort of run to some sort of set of principles or Ten Commandments or whatever you want to, to choose. You have to actually decide, but also to discuss. There is a, an openness, like a lack of closure um, that allows for unpredictability, that allows for um, well, the unknown and therefore the new. And that, to me, is what's really important. Does that answer your question? Not really? We'll talk about it. That means no. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for such high and dense paper, man. Um, I don't know if my question is related exactly to what you presented, and I'm sure that is somewhere through the idea to the notion of humanitas and participatory democracy and all that we were talking about. So the question could be that one of the dangers with this euphemism of plurality and participatory democracy is the notion of homogenization, which comes from me. And if it is post homogenization, right, what it deprives me of my heterogeneous sovereign identity. So I'm just curious, what is your stand on this conflict between homogenization and maintaining of heterogeneous identity? And how do we maintain the balance when I want to become part of this participatory democracy? Amen. I hope I made a question. I'm sure your question is brilliant. First, what? Heterogeneity. Okay, why do you think there's no heterogeneity in what she's talking about? Not in that way. When I'm talking about plurality, I'm, I'm part of this plurality which you are talking about, right. and participatory democracy. Right. If this homogeneous identity is forced on me, what homogeneous identity? Let's say being an Indian or being a yes. male Indian sitting, being seen in public eye, where I don't want, I don't want to be called or want to be denoted as something very special, right? So this forced homogenization deprives me. I mean. Where you ended your paper is just amazing, non-sovereign self, right? I'm just trying to understand this idea of non-sovereign self. Okay, it's a question. Yeah, yeah. When you said homogeneity, I had a completely different understanding of that. I thought you meant political homogeneity, and I just will say a word about that. Um, you know, all, all these political frameworks that we talk about with regard to, you know, how to political involve some kind of premise about you know how we can actually enter the political for example um, as I said in the paper you know it says you know this presupposes that everybody's willing to be honest that everybody is willing to listen to other people I mean there's a hugely utopian element in her work but I would say there's a hugely utopian element in everything um, some some you're worried about coming into the public sphere as a particular, internationally, globally, which is actually a universal in India. Right? Okay. You're worried that this uh, identity that is imposed on you, which you call the you're worried that it imposes a structure on you that basically silences you or um, invokes certain things from you. There are certain expectations from you in the public sphere. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, um, 
plurality she's talking about is not simply um, the plurality between cultures, you know, Indians versus Canadians or whatever. She's talking about all kinds of plurality. So what you are talking about is a particular public sphere. So you're talking about a public sphere in India where, in one sense, it's not public. Isn't that what you're saying? Yeah. I mean, if you're not, just say so. You can think about it. Yeah. This is where she says that, that I would say, anyway. <laughs> this is her, where her emphasis on risk really comes into play. Because if you are, uh, I'm just going to name the most kind of uh, marginalized person I can think of at the moment, a queer transvestite Dali, who's going to enter the public sphere. We know just from the social how that's going to play out. I don't actually know, but you guys do. There is somebody who is working under severe structures of oppression, severe uh, structures of silencing. So what, what constitutes courage? What constitutes risk? Speaking honestly. Now, speaking honestly can get you killed. That's what you're worried about, right? <laughs> what can I say? I have nothing to say to them. Because that is one of the utopian elements. Like what, what is courage? What is risk? We've seen people in history who have taken the risk, who have had courage, and have, who have been slaughtered. So there's no answer to that question. But it is a question that has to be both. Because if we want to develop some kind of culture of public sphere, let's say in the Iranian way, we have, to, we have to ask those questions. What are you going to do to me if I say this? I mean, I know exactly what you're talking about. Just to give you an analogy, of course, um, in my teaching, uh, I teach post-colonial theory, and naturally do stuff on race and gender. I am not going to go through an entire course not teaching what I think should be taught. So the first thing I say to students is no laptops or recording devices, because I want this to be a safe space. I want you to be able to speak and not feel that someone's recording you and upload it to the net and, you know, you're going to be persecuted. So what happens then is um, there is a safe space. And then I say to them, you know, you can say whatever you want. You can be a fascist. But you have to support what you're saying. And you can't be personal. You can't, you know, say things against particular people in the classroom. Okay? The point is that you can put things on the table that are politically very incorrect. Because where else, except the university, or your home, are you going to be able to talk about these things? So, I would say that the public sphere has to become something like that, but I mean, how utopian is that? Sorry, it's not I don't have the answers to that, sorry. Dear friends, no. Thank you for being very active listener that reflects in the quality of the questions you keep agreed. And now it's time to conclude this session. Thank you. This has been quite an interesting session. I hope Dr. Nanili's lecture has provoked us to give a little more attention to the hazy delimitations between the public and the private. I once again thank Nalini and Dr. Jai Singh for such a wonderful session.